Lord, we put our trust and our hope in you today. Lord, there is no one like you.
today. song she'd look at me she'd say Nate just remember never forget that God sees you never forget that God knows you never forget that he's as close as your breath to you and church I believe that when we start to live our life realizing that our God walks beside us that our faith begins to grow and we can sing out songs of praise we can have joy in our heart even in the midst of what this world would send against us. And so she would sing this song and remind me of that. She'd say, And I sing because I'm happy. And I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on sing today and I sing because I'm happy and I sing because I'm free for his eye is on Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Yes, Lord. You see us and you know us, Lord. Lord, so we call on you today. Hallelujah. I've 
all, can we just praise his name one more time? Lord, the power that's in your name. God, we put our faith, we put our trust in you and you alone. Jesus, there is truly no one like you. God, there is truly no one like you. God, I thank you and I praise you that you move among us. Lord, that you speak with authority into our lives over every situation, Lord God, over every bondage, Lord God, over every circumstance, Lord God, over every addiction, affliction, Lord God, over oppression, Lord God, that you speak with authority, Lord, and you set people free in Jesus' name. And so, Lord, today, that's where we stand as people of faith. Lord God, we declare that you are setting us free, Lord God, and that today is a new day in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we're going to sing your praise, Lord, and we're going to exalt you, Lord, because you have been faithful to us. You have been faithful to us, faithful to us, Lord, that truly is no one like you. Lord God, so I pray that today, Lord, that our hearts, our whole being, Lord, would be to glorify you and you alone you and you alone because you are worthy you are worthy come on all together can we just tell him today say you are worthy lord you are worthy of our praise you are worthy of our adoration you are worthy lord you are worthy lord you are worthy amen lord god we praise you in this place lord god and we speak it all in jesus mighty name come on somebody shout amen today amen Amen. As we continue to praise him today, turn to your neighbor, tell them about God's faithfulness in your life. Share a testimony with them this Sunday morning. Are y'all excited this morning? Well, if we're excited, just think about all of the testimonies that you have of the things that God has done in your life. So I just want to take three seconds and let's just give him some Holy Ghost filled praise in this place. Come on now, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. He's a good God. So my name is John Setzer. Um, I've been blessed with the honor and privilege to serve. I'm on the leadership team here at Sioux Falls First. And I'm telling y'all, I'm excited. This church is going places. I'm telling you, we are going places. And if you are brand new here today, we want to let you know that you are home. You are home. And so if you're brand new, you can connect with us. There's some um, uh, connection cards in the back of the seats. And we'll also have a QR code um, up on the screen as well that you can connect with us. And so once you do that, I promise you, we will be in contact with you because we love you and we want you here. So where are my worshipers at? My worshipers in here, make some noise. Come on now. Where are my worshipers at? There we go. All right, so this Friday, right here at Sioux Falls First, from 7 to 8 o'clock, I'm pretty sure that's the time, we will have a worship service here. So there's going to be prayer, there's going to be worship. And if you want something from God, you got to go and get it. So we want you to come here and get it, all right? And um, as our ushers get ready to come down, this is one of my favorite parts of the service because I don't know about y'all, but I grew up poor. And as a broke college student for a long time and a broke adult for a long time, God has done some miracles in my finances. And I'm telling you, when you trust him with your finances, he will do things for you financially that will blow your mind. And I'm sure there's so many testimonies in this house of what God has done. But when you give to this church, the seeds that you plant also go to helping us reach this community. How many, how many of you, you get excited when we talk about reaching this community and surrounding areas with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And that's what we want to do. And so I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to give our ushers an opportunity to serve the people. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to the name of your son, Jesus. 
Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to be here in the house of the Lord, to be here in your presence, Lord. And we thank you for the seeds that you have blessed us with to sow back into the kingdom. And we know that when we sow seeds in fertile soil, that it will produce a harvest. And Father God, I just pray that there would be an increase on every giver in this house today. And for the ones that can't give, Father God, we just pray that you would bless them and change and rearrange their situation for your glory. And Father God, right here, right now on this day, we thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you continue to do. In Jesus Christ's precious name, I pray. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Have a good one. Kit, and I serve on the prayer team here at Sioux Falls First. To everyone here in the house on our online campus, welcome home. Our online pastor is there now to connect with you and pray with you. Say hello in the comments section so we can see who's with us and reply to you. Please take a moment right now to share the service live stream in order for others to join in. Watching this live stream today may be the hope someone on your feed desperately needs. As we've ended our 21 days of prayer and fasting, we'd love to hear about your stories of what God did in you. Hop on our website and share with us under the prayer and testimony tab or on the Facebook fasting group. If you have served as a volunteer or a leader of an LC group or any other capacity here at Sioux Falls First, we invite you to the Dream Team celebration so we can honor you. Please sign up at SiouxFallsFirst.com slash registrations to RSVP for this celebration this Wednesday, January 25th. Our new semester life change group fair will be Sunday morning, January 29th, where each of our LC group leaders will be able to meet you and share what their group is studying. Come ready to see where you could get plugged into a group and build your walk in Christ and connect deeper with your Sioux Falls First family. Another way to connect deeper is to join us for our journey class on January 28th. This is a chance for you to meet our staff, hear our vision, and determine how you want to get involved and become part of the Sioux Falls First family. Sign up on our website to attend as we look forward to rolling out the red carpet for you on that day. Grab some friends or your life change group and join in our worship night here at church next Friday, January 27th from 7 to 8 p.m. to praise God for all he's done through our fasting and prayer time. I personally want to let you know about an impactful ministry the Holy Spirit is using to change the lives of incarcerated women. Red Cord Outreach once a week goes into the Minnehaha County Jail and occasionally visits the South Dakota Women's Prison and Pier, ministering to those women with the hope and restoration through Jesus Christ, developing relationships with each, and distributing donated Bibles from Sioux Falls First. If you would like more information on how to get involved with Red Cord Outreach, please contact me, Kit Murray. We like to be actively engaged with the message on Sunday mornings to be able to live out what God is showing us. So if you're like us, you can check out the message notes provided in the YouVersion Bible app or search in events to choose either Spanish or English. You can also find these notes on our website. As our series, The Conversationalist, continues this morning, open your mind and heart for what God has for you. Amen. Well, good morning. We welcome you to the house of the Lord today. We welcome our online campus as well. We're so glad that you've uh, chosen to join with us and and to take a seat with us and and, uh, just learn and let God speak to us. Again, we're so, so glad you're here. Encourage our online campus. Um, If you want to share your feed, we know that there are other people that might be able to receive what you um, are receiving today, and we pray that God would speak to them as well. Well, we've just come through 21 days of prayer and fasting. And uh, today, I'm, I'm getting a piece of meat. I mean, I'm just excited about that, just to let you know that. Um, but man, hopefully it's been just a rich time. Hopefully you've done something to, to deepen your faith, draw you closer to Jesus, make you more re- receptive to what he wants to do in your life in 2023 and beyond, what God wants to do in our church. And uh, let me just say, I, I was challenged even through the year for us um, to, to make some times where corporately uh, we pray, we fast together, we seek the Lord together, um, because never have we needed the empowerment of the Spirit of God like we need today. 
And uh, we know it's something that comes when we, we pay the price, pray the price, and really press into his heart. So I want to thank you for uh, joining with us and uh, really seeking the Lord um, together. Um, well, man, what a beautiful morning. Um, kind of felt like Narnia when you were driving to church today. Um, if you're like me, man, your phone was out and you're capturing all these pictures, um, just the beautiful trees. And man, what a beautiful place to live. Aren't you grateful you live here? Amen. For those online that are not living in Sioux Falls or not living in South Dakota, we welcome you. We'll receive you in our state. And uh, we're just, uh, man, excited about living here. Let me just say this too. It is Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. That's today. That's a Sunday where churches all around the nation are focusing on life. And I just want to pray today as we prepare our hearts to receive the word today. We receive, we receive the parable that Jesus is going to speak to us today. I also want us to pray for every life. From the womb to the tomb. Including the unborn, the just born. That we value them, we defend them, we protect them. Because God is a pro-life God. Amen? God is a life that believes in life. And, um, you know, equality starts in the womb. We know that. And so today we want to pray. We also want to do our part to pray for our governmental leaders. Scripture teaches us that we are to pray for those in authority. And I pray you're doing that. That we lift up our, our legislators. We lift up our congressmen and women. We lift up our governor and lift up our president and, and cabinet. We, that we are a church that prays for those in authority. We also pray that God would speak to their heart and help them lead God's way, right? And be convicted, convinced that we should be a people that defend life. This should not be a controversial topic, right? That we value life. So we're gonna pray um, with that today as well. Would you pray with me? Father, we love you. God, we thank you for the opportunity we have today. God, whether we are watching online or we're seated in the room, God, that we can take the seat of a disciple, we can open our heart to what you would speak to us today, that you would challenge us, you would motivate us, you would help us to be the living, breathing body of Christ on earth that is functioning according to the calling that you've given us. So Father, we pray you'd speak to us today. We pray that you'd move, Lord, our online campus. We pray you'd move across this building. Lord, move in kids' ministry and in our life change groups. God, I pray that you'd minister Lord God, in nursery and preschool, that you'd move in this room, God, that you would speak to us. But Father, today we also understand, Lord, on this Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, that we are going to pray. We're going to pray for our legislators. We're going to pray for those that lead us. God, we pray that you would help them, Lord God, to establish laws, God, to defend and protect life. Father God, we pray that you would, uh, Lord, minister, God, to those that, um, Lord, that are, that are making decisions. Lord God, to, to make sure that in their decision-making, they're thinking about, Lord, the, lives, the lives that need to be defended. God, we again pray that you would speak to us, challenge us. We open our hearts to the conviction and the voice of the Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name. And everybody shout out amen. Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles or devices, you can go ahead and turn to the book of Matthew chapter 25, we are continuing our series today called The Conversationalist, When Jesus Spoke in Parables. And as we walk through these parables, there's things that God would speak to us through a parable that would really challenge us. And I believe today is one of those messages. You see, when Jesus instructed his followers in his ministry, he gave them precepts of the kingdom of God, and he spoke primarily through parables. He would use earthly stories to reveal spiritual truth as well as the mysteries of God. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the parable of the 10 virgins. Now, in Matthew chapter 25, but it's really a continuation of the conversation Jesus was having with his disciples in Matthew chapter 24, where he's letting them know what they can expect as we come to the end of the age. He gives them signs that will indicate the nearness of his return to receive his church. These prophetic events cast shadows signaling of what is to come. 
And I will say, as I read through Matthew chapter 24 and even through the entirety of scripture, I'm understanding that these occurrences are increasingly evident in the world today. In fact, I truly believe that we very well could be the generation that experiences the rapture of the church or the catching away of the church that Paul speaks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And that also is the focus of our parable. Matthew chapter 25, I want you to read with me. Beginning at verse 1, we're reading out of the ESV. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in to him to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Verse 13, watch therefore, For you know not neither the day nor the hour. You see, this parable is about 10 virgins or bridesmaids who were invited to a wedding. Now, a first century Jewish wedding was a little bit different than what we experience in our culture. In fact, D.A. Carson describes this setting this way. Normally, the bridegroom with some friends left his home to go to his bride's home where there were various ceremonies followed by a procession through the streets after nightfall to his home. The 10 virgins may be bridesmaids who have been assisting the bride and they expect to meet the groom as he comes from the bride's house. Everyone in the procession was expected to carry his or her own torch. Those without a torch would be assumed to be party crashers or even brigands. The festivities, which might last several days, would formally get underway at the groom's house. So this torch was a small lamp with an oil tank that needed to be refilled occasionally to maintain the flame, to maintain the light. This is helpful in us understanding the story understanding what Jesus is communicating in that culture, in that context. So today I want to draw a couple of truths from this important parable and make application to our own lives. The first truth is this, the priority of oil in our lamp. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamp and went out to meet the bridegroom. I believe we can ascertain from this story that all 10 bridegroom or all 10 bridesmaids were invited to the wedding banquet, were invited to the ceremony. The symbolism of the 10 virgins would be those who are professing Christians and are awaiting the arrival of the bridegroom, which we know as Jesus Christ. Each have a lamp, each have a testimony of faith, and yet as we read through this story, we understand that a lamp is not enough, that there needs to be oil to fuel the lamp. In fact, if the oil ran out, the lamp was virtually useless. Now, from Genesis to Revelation, we understand that oil was a symbolism of the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit who is the agent of salvation, the Holy Spirit who dwells in our lives and in our hearts. In fact, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, and it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us, that's the oil language, and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Romans 8, 9 says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ or the Holy Spirit does not belong to him. If the Holy Spirit does not dwell inside of us, then we do not belong to God. We understand that when we repented of our sins, when we confessed him as Lord, when we had that experience of salvation, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit came to take residence inside of us as we became the temple or the temples of the Holy Spirit. We know that then as we live, the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us into all truth. We know that's at moments where the Holy Spirit will convict us and he will say, you shouldn't be saying that. You shouldn't be talking like that. Or maybe your behavior on these busy streets in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, you shouldn't act like that, right? The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit becomes our convictor. The Holy Spirit becomes the one that guides us and leads us and and even comforts us. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. But this is the defining mark of a believer that we become the, the, the housing of the Holy Spirit of God because we receive him at salvation. Now, without the indwelling occupation of the Holy Spirit or according to this parable, the oil We are just an empty lamb. So out of the 10 virgins, five of them were wise because they had plenty of oil. Five of them were foolish because they didn't have enough. I would envision them as the ones who think they can take a 30 mile trip on an empty tank of gas, right? It's on E, I I think I can make it. They're the ones calling family members or friends or triple A saying, hey, come get me because I ran out of gas. That's really the, the, the attitude that is in them, even as ones who had the lamp. But at midnight, while the bridegroom delayed, and the Bible says because of the delay, that they became weary, they became tired, but at midnight, there was a cry that said the bridegroom has come to meet them. And the Bible says all of them, the wise and the foolish, rose up and they began to trim their wicks because at the late hour, their lights had become dimmed. They trimmed them by removing the burnt parts of the linen or the torch so that they would burn bright again. They would dip them in fresh oil to reignite the flame. But it's interesting in this exercise, in them hearing the cry and getting up and trimming their lamps, that the five foolish virgins spoke to the five wise ones and said, hey, we realize that we, we, are, we are out of oil. Like there's no oil in the lamp, there's no supply, we didn't bring any with us. And they're saying, can we borrow some? Would you give us some oil so that we can refill our lamps? The prepared ladies told the unprepared ones, hey, we don't have enough for us and you. We don't wanna run out. And so why don't you go to the store? Why don't you go and purchase some oil for yourself? And the Bible tells us that they went to purchase some oil, but while they were gone, the bridegroom came And those who were ready went to meet him, came into the the, the banquet hall, and the Bible says the door was shut. The door was shut. Just like the door was shut on the ark when Noah and his family and all the animals got in. The door was shut. Indicating that those who were ready were inside the ark or inside the, the marriage banquet hall, but those outside missed it. It's really a picture of of the rapture. 
And, and I, don't, I know we don't hear a lot about that today. Nobody's really talking a lot about the, the coming of the Lord, but, but this is the reality expressed in this parable of making sure that we're wise and not foolish, making sure that we're ready and not unprepared. Now, as I read through this story and, and, and we, we live in this time of, of social justice and there's so many things about social justice that are so important because they really come from the gospel, right? But as, as I read through this, I thought, man, wouldn't it be noble, wouldn't it be kind for these wise virgins to give some of their oil because it says they had flasks of oil, give some of the oil that they have to the foolish virgins, we would think, man, that, that's something that we, we teach our kids to share, right? I mean, we, we talk about sharing and how important that is. And, and yet, as we read through this story, we get a great understanding that if it would have been possible, maybe they would have. But this parable shows us that the oil supply is personal. And our relationship with God can't be transferred to another person that you are not going to get to heaven one day based on the coattails of a family member or a friend. That you and I are not going to enter into heaven based on somebody else's decision to follow Jesus. That it's personal, and that's exactly what Jesus is expressing in this parable. In fact, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 brings clarity to this when it says, the soul who, soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. You see, the word of God teaches the principle of individual responsibility when it comes to salvation. Every person is accountable to God for their own life and for their own eternal destination. You and I before God have to make that decision. You and I have to be prepared for that day, whenever it may be. And that leads to the, to the second truth, and that is the preparation for the unpredictable moment. I remember being in middle school and uh, going to Geneseo Junior High School. It was a, right in the middle of our, our community, and it was a three-story old building. I think since then it's been tore down, and they got a new middle school now. But I remember um, coming out of my school and looking over at the church across the street, and they had this big neon bright sign that said this, Jesus is coming soon. I remember walking out and seeing that continually. Obviously, I, I had uh, encountered Jesus as a, as a child, and, and I was attending church, and that was just a reminder to me to, that, that Jesus could come back at any hour. He could come back at any moment. Uh, my, my mom would, would, would teach me. My, my dad would teach me and say, son, you just want to be ready. And in fact, um, I remember even as a kid hearing this message that was preached a lot, in the, in the early years, and, and uh, I remember even growing up and hearing this message that Jesus is coming soon. In fact, in the early part of the last century, we know that that was one of the few messages they preached. And a lot of times Sunday night, they would bring their lost friends, their lost uh, family members, and people would get saved, and they would res respond. Well, I remember my mom sending me across the street before she got saved, and it was a, a little church in Cleveland, Illinois. I've shared this with you. Uh, only church in town, Cleveland Assembly God Church, about 20 people on a good day. And, uh, you know, the, the lady that played the piano was my Sunday school teacher. or She was my mentor. And, well, well one night they, they were having these, revi these revival nights. And the revival nights meant that they were going to show the end time movies, right? You know, Image of the Beast and, uh, you know, the Rapture movies. And, and I remember that night. I was about six years old. I remember watching these movies. I mean, it was cheesy acting, but it was, it was, it was true what they were portraying. And I remember running to the altar and giving my life to Jesus. I remember like, man, I don't wanna miss the rapture, right? And, and we understand that, um, you know, there's a maturity in us that, that, that causes us to realize, you know, that it's not about the fear that, you know, drives us towards the Lord, that it's about a relationship and the benefit of that relationship. But in my young mind, in my young heart, I didn't want to miss the rapture. And, um, and I remember coming home one day after hearing that, I think it was probably a couple weeks after watching these movies, I came home, and, uh, and, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't see my mom. 
And I, and I thought, wow, this is not good. <laughs> dad was working. Of course, dad wasn't where he needed to be with the Lord. So I figured, hey, we're probably, you know. But, but I thought, oh my gosh. And that was before caller ID. How many know caller ID is, it's, it's a blessing and a curse, right? And uh, I remember calling like my Sunday school teacher. And she answered the phone. I set down the phone. It's like, praise God, I didn't miss it. Because she wouldn't have missed it, right? How many of you ever had experiences like that? Come on, be honest. Well, I, uh, I, I know that, there, that this, is, this is a message that may not be preached as much because we've heard it. And I know some people would even say, you know, I've heard this message all my life. I've heard Jesus is coming soon and he hasn't come back yet, right? And, and there would be mockers. In fact, I was even kind of Googling this and I thought, oh my gosh, all these people that are, that are kind, of, kind of making fun, poking fun at this idea that Jesus could come back at any moment, the imminent return of Jesus. And uh, do you realize that the apostle Peter knew this day would come? He knew this day would come. In fact, he says in 2 Peter chapter three, um, he says that, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but he is patient because he's not wanting anyone to perish, but all come to eternal life, right? All come to repentance. That that he's wanting to give people opportunity to respond to him. In this season, in this dispensation of grace, he's wanting people to know him, experience him. That's why he sent Jesus for you and I to have eternal life. And he's giving opportunity to, to, for people to take him up on the offer of salvation. And, and then it says that with the Lord, a day is a thousand years, a thousand years is a day. And, and, and sometimes we are limited in our view of time. We don't really understand the, the fullness of time and eternal time. But then towards the end of that passage, he says this in verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. I've never known a thief that announces that he's coming. Thief usually comes when you least expect it. Thief usually comes in in the middle of the night when you're sleeping. Thief comes in stealth. And what he's telling us in this passage, the apostle Peter, this is what Jesus is speaking in our parable, that he could come at any moment. And again, as we read through scripture, we realize that there's not many things left to be fulfilled. So much has been fulfilled. So much is happening. When we read about the last days and what, is, what, what was prophesied through the word of God is happening right now in our day, in our culture, not just America. Sometimes we have to take the American lens off and put the global lens on and realize, hey, this is happening around the globe. This is taking place. And the alarm was that we need to be ready. We don't know when it's gonna happen, but I will tell you, we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. Therefore, we have to prepare hearts. Clearly the wise virgins who took the extra oil were prepared, they were ready for his coming. The foolish ones were not, even though they looked prepared. This is how it will be. When Jesus returns, unfortunately, many will look prepared because they have lamps, but won't be prepared because they have no oil. Listen, it might be church members, could be clergy. It could be those that are serving in their church, serving in their community. It might be people with great spiritual heritage and legacy. It might be people that have a good reputation. As good as those things are, as wonderful as those things are, we know it's not enough. You can't just have a polished lamp. You have to have oil in the lamp. You have to have the supply. You have to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. In fact, the five wise virgins who had the extra oil represent those who are truly born again. Looking for the glorious appearing of Jesus, have a genuine faith, determined that no matter how long it takes, no matter what kind of adversity they face, they're gonna be ready for the return of Jesus. They're gonna be anticipating the bridegroom. 
Hebrews 9.28 describes them when it says, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. I would say the five foolish virgins without the oil represent make-believers who may enjoy the benefits of Christian community, but without an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse 11 through 13. Afterward, the other virgins, the foolish ones came and said, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. What's therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour? Reminds me, of what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, when it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father and who is in heaven on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. He's speaking about those who had no oil. He's speaking about those who were unprepared. In fact, when they came back and they knocked on the door, the door had been closed. The door was eternally sealed. When they knocked on the door, the Lord said those words. I don't know you, what a sober thought. You see, while everyone was invited to the wedding banquet, only the prepared with oil and lamps were able to enter. And I want you to hear this, their motivation for preparation was to focus on their destination, the wedding banquet. They realize that we are journeying on this earth. We're pilgrimaging on this earth. But one of these days, we are gonna enter a city whose maker and builder is God. One that the faithful have entered into before us where we can spend eternity with him. In fact, in John chapter 14, the disciples are there and Jesus is kind of letting them know, hey, don't be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I'm going, you're gonna be able to come. And Thomas says, hey, we don't know the way. You didn't give us a roadmap. We don't really know where you're going. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Like if you just follow me, I'll get you there. If you surrender to me, if you live a life of lordship in in your life, that you'll be able to enter into that place, that destination, that wedding banquet. In fact, I want to close with this. And missionary pilot Bob Griffin's book, Cleared for Takeoff, one idea appeared often. A good pilot must have a good flight plan. My father-in-law was a pilot. Got to go on the plane with him. I know we have many pilots in our church that I've had opportunity to sit down with them and talk to them about some of their experiences and some of the crazy things that have taken place in their lives and on their flights. But airports require pilots to file a flight plan that includes their travel route and destination. A missionary pilot often flying to and from small landing strips across uncharted territory must know how to get where he's going and where to put the plane down when he arrives. He has to know the course to stay on as if he would fly blind through dense fog or may have to know and rely on visual checkpoints such as mountains and rivers. Every aspect of his flight must be known, especially the landing. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we too have a flight plan We know that our destination is heaven. We know that each day we are to follow the course of obedience that has been carefully mapped out for us in the Bible. Even though we fly through the cultural fog, even though we may fly through difficult days and hard days and tough moments, we know that we have a destination that we're not at yet. We realize that we are in flight en route to a place that God has prepared for us, that God has paid for through the blood of Jesus Christ. We just have to make sure we're ready. I want to tell you this, when when the airplane comes, I want to be at the airport. Are you with me? Man, I I want to be ready. I want to be be on the tarmac. I want to be ready when when Jesus comes back. And that's exactly what this scripture is talking about. We, We know our destination. We know our flight plan. We understand the word of God is the lamp, the light that leads us and directs us. And that's how we're going to get there. And church, I'm so grateful that parables like this are in scripture to help us understand the importance of having oil in our lamps. 
In fact, really, this is a warning in many ways to people that think they're okay. But as you take inventory, you realize, man, you know what? I'm not really in Christ. I'm not really living in the hope of, uh, hope of glory. I'm not really, I really have no oil in my lamp. There's hesitation. There's questions in your mind. You know what scripture says? These things are written that you may know you have eternal life. It's not a gamble. It's not a guessing game. It's not, it's, it's not rolling the dice. I mean, you can know where you're going. And, and as we know him, as we walk with him, then there's an anticipation that, you know what, beyond this life, and whether we leave through rapture of the church or whether we leave through death, we know where we're going. And our eyes are set on there. And because our eyes are set on the heavenly city, our eyes are set on heaven, it impacts how we live now, right? In fact, scripture says, he who has his hope inside of himself purifies himself, even as he's pure. Like, like we live differently because we know where we're going. Not only that, we live with an understanding that more people need to know. We want to pack the flight. Are you with me? We want to get as many people saved and on their way to heaven than ever before. We believe that's going to be part of this great awakening. That's going to be part of this last day revival is people are going to realize there are no answers in this world. That our answers come from God. Jesus is the answer. And and we want to do our part to make sure that people know that, experience that, encounter him in a real way. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me, Father? We love you today. We thank you, Lord, that we live in a time of grace. The Holy Spirit is speaking. The Holy Spirit is convicting. God, whether it's people in the room, people watching online, people watching later, you're, you're speaking to us about our own life. You're speaking to us about our own lamp. God, that the reality of people on the outside may not realize we have no oil in our lamp. But God, we know. We we realize it, Lord. And I pray in this service, God, whether it's someone who's never ever cried out to Jesus for their salvation, that they've never confessed their sins and called on the name of the Lord to come and redeem them and save them, I pray you'd give them courage to say yes to you today. God, for those that may feel like, you know what, there's so many questions in my mind because maybe I've seen Christ as Savior, but I've not seen him as Lord. Maybe I have leaned upon works, good works, reputation, more than the substance of the Holy Spirit living inside of me. Lord, I pray that you give them courage to respond to you today too. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and say, Pastor Quentin, that's me. I want to make a full, clear decision that I'm going to follow Jesus, that I'm going to surrender to him. If I can know, I want to know. And I know through surrender, I know through repentance, turning away from my sin and turning to him. It's not that I don't make mistakes. It's not that I don't stumble. Thank God scripture says that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, cleanse us. We're grateful for that. But that there is a vibrant relationship with Jesus, an authentic relationship with Jesus that makes me anticipate the bridegroom coming. If that's you today and you realize you need him, you want to surrender to him, would you just lift your hand up and wave at me? Anybody here today and say, you know what, I don't know where I'm at, but I want to know. I'm not sure about my relationship with Jesus, but I want to be sure. Anybody here today, we're just going to wait a few moments on the floor, in the balcony, online. You can reach out to our online pastor. Anybody here today that would say, that's me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. Church, I'd like to ask you to stand. I'd like to ask our prayer team to come. And here's how we're gonna close out today. Maybe you didn't raise your hand, you know you needed to. You feel the Holy Spirit sense him knocking. You sense him 